I read about it just like everybody else. It was really breaking news. I got the SI Live push notification and literally looked at it and was like, what? In all honesty, I don't think that I knew that the campus was in danger of closing, and I don't know, I didn't know how bad the numbers were. And I think it took everybody by surprise, even the employees. When you talk to people who work there on the campus, they had no idea either, even the students. When you read the university's statement, the picture became a little bit clearer. There had been a 63% decline in enrollment over the past several years, which was exacerbated by the pandemic. The campus, which originally opened in 1934, had been greatly expanded over the years. It was equipped to accommodate 3,000 students. And in 2021, enrollment had slipped to just 861. So when you heard those numbers, you kind of understood it. But just like everybody else, I was very shocked about it. After more than 50 years serving the Staten Island community, the St. John's University campus on Grimes Hill is closing its doors for good, prompting concerns among the community that the longtime education facility could give way to a wave of residential development. Welcome to the Staten Island Advances from the Scene, a podcast bringing you an inside look at the biggest stories on Staten Island with the reporters who cover them. I'm your host, Eric Bascom, and this week I'm joined by Staten Island Advance business and real estate reporter Jessica Jones-Gorman to discuss the closing of St. John's University's Staten Island campus and the uncertain future of the Grimes Hill property. Thanks for joining me today, Jess. Always a pleasure having you on. And, you know, as a St. John's alum yourself at the Staten Island campus, right, I was wondering if you could just tell us a little bit about your experience there and how you felt when you heard that the school would be closing. Yes, I'm a St. John's alum. I graduated from the Staten Island campus 25 years ago, and I taught there as an adjunct for about a decade, too. So as you can imagine, news of the closure really hit home for me. I think the best thing about going to school on Grimes Hill is that you had the experience of attending a large university coupled with the comfort of a really tight-knit atmosphere. On Monday, Wednesday, Friday, you could take classes here on the island, and then maybe you'd have 20 to 30 kids in your class. And then on Tuesdays and Thursdays, you could travel into Queens, and you could sit in on a lecture hall that had 100 plus in it. But you didn't have to commute to Jamaica if you didn't want to, because the campus had it all here. You had Greek life, you had clubs, activities, and you had a faculty that was very one-on-one with the students. For better or for worse, your professors knew who you were, you know, whether you didn't want them to or not. (laughs) And they call on you by name. You weren't really a number when you attended the Staten Island campus, but you got that piece of paper from St. John's University. So that was the difference. Yeah, no, that's a great way of looking at it. And uh, I think, uh, fittingly enough, we have some students from St. John's joining us today. They are taking a class taught by my boss and our colleague, Tracy Papora, who has been an adjunct there as well. For years now, I've pretty much since I started here, I've been going and visiting the campus, visiting her classes, talking to the young journalism students just about the job and about the community and all of those sorts of things, which is something that I've always really enjoyed. And so I know that here at the Staten Island Advance, at least, we have a lot of St. John's between some of our colleagues, our bosses, uh, you, and and, and all this stuff. And so it it really kind of hit home, I think, for a lot of people here. And so so I'm just kind of curious, can you tell me a little bit, like when when we first found out about this, that it was closing, what was the reaction? What did you hear? What was the university saying? So I was actually on vacation when I found out that the campus was closing. I think you covered the story in my absence. I read about it just like everybody else. It was really breaking news. I got the SI Live push notification and literally looked at it and was like, what? In all honesty, I don't think that I knew that the campus was in danger of closing, and I don't know, I didn't know how bad the numbers were. And I think it took everybody everybody by surprise, even the employees. When you talk to people who work there on the campus, they had no idea either, even the students. When you read the university's statement, the picture became a little bit clearer. There had been a 63% decline in enrollment over the past several years, which was exacerbated by the pandemic. The campus, which originally opened in 1934, had been greatly expanded over the years. It was equipped to accommodate 3,000 students. And in 2021, enrollment had slipped to just 861. So it's a big difference between 3,000. So when you heard those numbers, you kind of understood it. But just like everybody else, I was very shocked about it. Yeah, absolutely. And this is kind of the same thing that we've seen happen over and over again with a lot of the Catholic schools on Staten Island uh, at the elementary school level, at the high school level. I know St. John Villa, obviously, most notably, which we'll talk a little bit about later as well. This is just kind of the same thing we're hearing over and over again, lower enrollment numbers. It's financial decisions at the end of the day, which is sad because, like we've said, these are places that hold so much significance to people who who have so many memories there and who graduated from there and take so much pride in in having attended there. And so it, it can be really difficult. I know when I, I guess it was just last year when the St. Christopher School closed, it was a tough cover. I mean, going on the last day of school and seeing parents crying, people had told me, you know, 
I, I had graduated here when I was a kid, and now my kid will never get to graduate. Their kid was a year away when the school closed. And so things like that, I, I, I think there's a lot of the same feelings around the closing of a college as there are, you know, with the, some of the other Catholic schools here on Staten Island. So I know that it's it's really difficult. So I'm curious. I, I know that you said that enrollment had been down quite a bit, but there were still obviously a, a decent amount of students there. So what happened to the students who were enrolled at the campus or are enrolled? What, when they found out, what kind of options were they given in terms of their their future education? Sure. And side note, St. Christopher's was my grammar schools. So. Oh, really? <laughs> well, you are, you're having a tough one. Yeah. Hang on, St. Josephville Academy, because that's where I went to high school. <laughs> So the university announced that there would be a two-year phase-out process, which started in 2022, as soon as they announced it. And that's now wrapping up. You're in 2024. This is the last semester. Junior and senior undergrad students at that time were going to be able to finish their degree because they only had two years left. Incoming first-year students and sophomores had to choose between finishing their degrees on the Queens campus or transferring to another school. To make that transition a little bit easier, students who resided in university housing for the 2024-2025 academic year received a housing grant. It was valued at about $11,000. They even St. John's even set aside a block of rooms for Staten Island students to make sure that there would be accommodations for them. And Staten Island students retained their tuition because the tuition on the St. John's, uh, the Staten Island campus, is $13,000 less than Queen's tuition. So they promised that. So they did give them a lot of accommodations. Like you said, it seems like they've they kind of tried to go above and beyond in this way. But also, um, as you were saying in the open, uh, it's still hurts to not have that convenience and comfort of home. And e- even though they're saying, yes, you know, we'll we'll reserve spots for you and we'll, we'll, you know, maintain your lower tuition rate and all these things, these people still now have to commute to Queens if they want to continue there. They either either that or, or you know, transfer to a different school altogether and, and, and all of those types of adjustments. I mean, I remember when I was just going away to college and your first year or two, you finally feel like you're getting your footing. And then now all of a sudden the community that you've built and the friends that you've made, people are kind of scattering off in all different directions. And so uh, I imagine that that was, that was definitely challenging for for a lot of the students who were there. But I want to talk a little bit about something we talked about a lot on the last podcast I had you on when we were talking about the Alba House being purchased by the Tunnels to Towers Foundation. And that is kind of the idea of whenever these large properties are being sold on Staten Island or being up, put up for sale. We see a lot of Staten Islanders get really nervous about what might come next and what's going to be built there. And so I'm curious what we've heard from the residents, what you might have heard, uh, just in terms of some of those concerns that we've been that the residents have been having. Sure. Residents, of course, have had a lot to say about this sale. After living next to a reasonably quiet neighbor for decades, all of a sudden they're concerned about what's going to take its place, rightfully so. Of course, the rumor mill starts turning, social media takes place, you know, everyone pontificates on that. And housing, of course, has been the number one concern. You know, people are talking about, can they jam hundreds of multiple dwellings in there? Yes, it's zoned for residential. So what could they put? Uh, One person at the meeting I went to the other night compared it to army barracks. Are they going to put army barracks in here? So I think that's what people are thinking. And yes, of course, migrant shelters, that idea has been lofted. But again, it's just all random rumors. The university has not yet disclosed who the bar will be. The property zoning is R31, which is residential, and as of right permits building semi-detached one and two family homes as well as fully detached homes. So of course, another educational facility go there, but there is that possibility that it could be housing. Yeah. And I mean, if you drive around the neighborhood, you'll see that there are already a a good amount of those multi-residences in that area along Arlo Road and, and some of the other streets around there. So it's not that it would necessarily be out of character with the neighborhood necessarily, but then on the other side of the street often on on Howard Avenue, you have these big sprawling estates. And so there's two different realities almost living up there and, and, and experiences for those people. And so I imagine that it wouldn't necessarily be new for them to place these kinds of things there, but it would also obviously change the density and the amount of things. I mean, also the, the bus lines up there aren't great. Who knows if the infrastructure is ready to handle uh, influx of, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of new people in the area. And then are the schools going to be overcrowded? And, and these are all development concerns that we hear over and over again. And so, and that are valid, right? That you need to be able to, if you're going to build something somewhere, support the people who are expected to live there. And then, as you said, also the the migrant shelter thing is something that we had heard. We kind of lived it with St. John Villa, right? And with what had happened there and the school was sold and the city said that they were going to maintain it as an education facility. But then 
you know, with all of the migrant crisis and and almost at this point, almost 200,000 coming in from spring 2022 to now, you know, about half of which still remain in, in the city shelter system. That was a place that people were not expecting it. And then they were placed there and people were justifiably upset and it became a whole big thing. And I mean, I'm sure our listeners and readers know because we did all over our all over our website for a long time. So that's obviously something that people were concerned about as well. But from what I understand in reading your reporting, they kind of said that that was not going to be the case, right? That they have not had any discussions with New York City about that. They said outright, it won't be a migrant shelter. So that is good to know. The one main concern, too, that uh, a lot of the residents brought up was the trees. This was a very big concern with a lot of people. And St. John's actually, uh, you know, acknowledged that. They said that they were counting the trees. I guess when you do any type of development, you have to have a certain number of trees. And they were tagging them and counting them. And residents just assumed that meant that they were going to be cutting them down. So, but they said that that's not the case. They were just counting them, tagging them. And that was, but everybody was very concerned. It's a very well manicured piece of land up there. And people wanted to remain that way. Yeah, absolutely. And so you mentioned this meeting. That's kind of what prompted this. Obviously, we've known about this pending sale for a long time. But recently, you went and covered a meeting at the, I believe it was the Grimes Hill Estates Association, where officials from the college went and spoke to some of the community residents. And I'm just kind of curious what that meeting was like, what they were able to share. It sounds like, you know, there was, as we call it, sometimes a non-update update. update. (laughs) And so I'm curious kind of how that went. Yep. So it was a civic association meeting at Notre Dame Academy, actually. So right there on the block where St. John's is. Two reps from St. John's were there to discuss next steps. They announced that there's one very serious buyer who will most likely purchase the property. But because of non-disclosure agreements, real estate contingencies, things like that, they couldn't disclose who that buyer is. So residents were obviously very upset by this. They felt that the university is not being completely transparent And they have been very transparent during this whole process, but as it's getting very close to the end now, they're starting to get a little unruly. I wouldn't classify the meeting as contentious, but it wasn't polite either. Residents asked a lot of questions, direct inquiries, if the property would be used as a shelter, if the city was eyeing it. The rep said no on both of those counts, like we said. But there really was no other transfer of information, non-update update, as you said. Lots of questions left unanswered. And I think that was a general consensus. As everyone was leaving, they wrapped it up. It said, this has been an hour. You know, calling it quits. And people were just, they still had questions. And a lot of them just went unanswered. We'll be right back. The Mayor of Maple Avenue is a powerful multi-part podcast about Sean Sinisey, a victim of former Penn State football coach Jerry Sandusky, who was arrested 10 years ago for numerous child sexual abuse charges. The podcast series is written and hosted by Pulitzer Prize winning reporter Sarah Gannam, who takes listeners into the world of addiction rehabilitation, where society can be quick to celebrate the consequences for abusers while not addressing the needs of their victims. Subscribe now to the Mayor of Maple Avenue wherever you get your podcasts. Yeah, and so that that kind of makes me believe that, uh, and again, this is all hypothesizing and all of this kind of stuff, that they are in some ways maybe fearful of the pushback that they would get if they were to say, we know who the buyer is, it's going to be this person. Then all of a sudden you have people complaining about it, you have us writing articles about people complaining about it, and this is all before the sale is finalized, are they going to get enough pushback? To- so in my mind, it's 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 likely, you know, we kind of wait and see, and then when we after we cross the T's and dot the I's and sign the paperwork, then we kind of let people know when it's too late for them to do anything about it, which is a tough way to operate. But again, as you mentioned, this is... You know, they own this property. This is property that is zoned for potential residential housing. And so they are within their right to do this. But I think it can be a little frustrating for the public when it seems like they know what they're doing. They just don't want to tell you it yet. And and I think that that's no one ever really likes that feeling. Right. And so my impression after reading your article was that that that's kind of how I felt about it. And so I'm curious kind of what now, (laughs) what now, actually? So what, what, what happens with the future of the property? I mean, at least until the sale is, is completed. Obviously, it's still some classes going on, final exams, all of that kind of stuff. But when does that wrap up? And then what will the campus kind of look like in the interim while they're waiting in, in the in-between time, I suppose? Classes end on April 29th, and then there's about a week of finals. So you're looking at the first week in May when then it will be completely vacant. According to the SAU reps, the university um, will begin to clear out the property at that point. So first week in May. and for But as, for, as long as they are the owner... They have intentions to secure it, keep a uh, you know security guard there 24-7, and keep the lights on, which was also a main concern with 
everyone on the campus. And driving home from that meeting, I did notice how bright it is even at 11 o'clock at night. You know, there's floodlights and there's the whole campus is lit up. So they're going to continue to do that until it's sold. But they expect that the sale will be complete before the end of the summer. So I guess in a few months, we'll know what's the, the, the fate of it will be. Yeah. And so, uh, I, you know, I already kind of gave my opinion on this uh, during the last question, but I was just curious before we wrap up sort of your best guess on on what it is going to happen at, at the property based on, you know, what you've heard at the meetings, the reporting that you've done. When this was first announced, there was a big push from everyone. We want this to remain an educational facility. It's the same thing we talked about with St. John Villa. They're like, hey, this is a ready made, ready to go property for for higher education, for for any type of education, really. And so that has been a really strong push. It doesn't appear in my mind that that is the way that it seems to be going. But I'm curious, obviously, you're the expert here as our real estate reporter. What, what, what do you think is kind of the most likely outcome here? So it's hard to say because the answers that we've repeatedly gotten from St. John's is that the potential buyer matches the zoning. It's kind of their canned statement. Potential buyer matches the zoning. But what matches the zoning? Another educational facility or housing? They said they spoke to, the, and they called it their neighbor down the, the block, so we know that's Wagner College. But at the meeting, they directly said that interest from higher ed didn't go very far. So that was the direct quote from them. They threw out words like smart growth, smart development. So if you're asking me to guess, I mean, I think I'm leaning in the same direction you are. I'm going to say it's housing. I do think that St. John's is approaching it very cautiously. After Mount Manresa and all the feedback from the community and elected officials on that, I think they're on high alert about the fate of what's going to happen with this land. Everything that they stated in the meeting, we've been a good neighbor for decades. It's a priority for us to maintain that legacy. I think it is very important for them. If housing is going to be built there, whether it's across the entire property or just on a portion of it, because I think that's a possibility, maybe the entire property won't be housing, could be a portion of it, we don't know. I think it's going to be within the character of the community. But like you said, there is different characters of that community. You have the Arlo Road apartments, which is student housing, but then you do have these grand mansions. So what could it be? But I think all of Staten Island is hoping for it to remain in that character. Everybody loves it up there. Um, Council, Council Member Camilla Hanks was there, and that's that was her quote. She said, people love drive, driving by here. People love, you know, to to see the views and to... So I think that's their intention, to keep it in the character um, and, you know, keep it beautiful, keep it landscaped, keep it well-maintained. Yeah, and this is also something that, you know, we discussed on the last podcast, the idea that... You know, people always get upset when it's going to be residential housing being built on a large property that wasn't previously used for that. But then at the same time, there is a need for housing and the housing prices are ridiculous. I can say I live in that neighborhood. I mean, I live down the road, right? But I'm five minutes from there and my apartment's very expensive. And maybe if there were a hundred more of them, the price gets driven down a little bit. And it's obviously not a perfect world. That's not necessarily, we all know supply and demand doesn't work as well as it, as it should sometimes. But, it, you know, in theory, it becomes difficult because there are people who say, you know, we don't want this. You're ruining the character of Staten Island and this is overdevelopment and this is this and this is that. But then it's also at the same time, we need housing. We need affordable housing that people can, you know, be able to, to live in and not feel as though they're paying 100% of their paycheck towards. And so it's, it's always a balancing act with this kind of stuff. And so I really think kind of the best outcome is what you described in that if they do end up building housing there, they do it in a way that is respectful to the character of the community, to the residents there, and in a way that people can kind of get on board with. And so it's definitely a big topic and one that we'll be covering very closely in the upcoming months. And I'm sure that when we do find out what's going on there, you will hear from us again on that. So thank you so much for joining me today, Jess. It's always great having you on. Of course. Same. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to the Staten Island Advances from the scene. If you like what you've heard, please make sure to rate and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and visit silive.com for the latest on all these stories and more. Thank you for supporting local journalism.